Okay, we better get started. So I'm really excited to welcome Jake Lowenstern as our colloquium speaker today. Jake is a research geologist with the USGS and currently at the Cascades Volcano Observatory. And he is the chief of the Volcano Disaster Assistance Program, which coordinates the US response to global volcanic disasters. And Jake has previously served as the scientist in charge of the Yellowstone Volcano Observatory. So in short, Jake has had all of the coolest volcanology jobs. And as far as I can tell, he's basically like the Indiana Jones of volcanology. Um, and scientifically, he's focused on the interaction of magmas with hydrothermal systems. And he's an expert in gas and isotope geochemistry and petrology. So Jake did his geological training as an undergrad at Dartmouth College and as a graduate student at Stanford. And his research has taken him all around the world, um, including a couple of year long stints that we're very envious of in Sicily and Japan. Um, and today, I believe we're gonna hear about volcanoes in the US and Iceland and Indonesia. Uh, and yeah, Jake's talk today is about some thoughts on volcanoes their eruptions and how we can best mitigate their negative impacts. And um, so, yeah, thank you very much. And over to you, Jake. Okay, well, thank you very much, Megan. Uh, I appreciate the invitation and I very much uh, enjoyed chatting with people for the, the last hour, not something I get to do every day uh, right now. And so uh, it's, it's, it's always fun. So let me go and share my screen. Fine. There we are. And play. So has everybody got that on their screen now? Okay, and everybody can hear me okay? All right, let me minimize that. So, uh, I, uh, yeah, I'm gonna give a talk that I've never given before. Um, I've given parts of this at different meetings um, and little bits here and there, but I've never really put it together uh, in one place at one time. So uh, you're a bit of an experimental talk and we'll see how it goes. Um, let's see. That is not moving the slide, what it normally would. Hmm. I've had this problem on the first slide before. Are, are the arrow keys working? No, or, um, or... I can try to move off the, uh, do... oh, oh, there we go. oh, did you do that? <laughs> nope, nope, nothing to do with me. <laughs> okay, um, well, we'll talk about this slide now since it's the next one. Um, so I'm going to give this from the perspective of uh, my work and my colleagues' work and the history of the Volcano Disaster Assistance Program. So this is a, a program that's been around now for uh, 34 years. And our goal is to stop uh, volcanic eruptions from becoming volcanic disasters. Uh, it was founded in, in 1986 after the eruption of Nevado del Ruiz in uh, Colombia. And that was an eruption where mud flows killed about 25 to 30,000 people uh, during the night of November 13th, exactly, uh, well, in 1985, um, 25, 35, 35 years ago today. And, um, and since that time, we've been funded through USAID to assist foreign countries uh, a lot of our work as early on was actual responses, going to the countries during volcanic crises, installing equipment, uh, helping the people there interpret what was happening and try and uh, provide useful messages. Um, since that time, we do a lot more uh, capacity building, donations, and education. And so the nature of our work is, has changed, though we definitely still do responses. And I will talk a little bit about some of them today. Okay, that's still not working. It looks, okay, it looks like I can click the screen and it works. Um, so some of the things that we uh, are gonna chat about today, um, we're gonna talk about eruptions. 
We're going to talk about how good we are at forecasting them. What are the things that hinder our progress? How do well do we understand magmatic systems? What's a typical run up to an eruption? Um, and then how does this all fit in the science that we do in terms of keeping people safe? What's the role of science and what's a good forecast? And so these are some of the things we're not gonna have answers to all of these questions, but these hopefully are things that uh, we can get you to think about. And uh, eventually um, uh, we, you can ask questions uh, when we're done. I've divided the talk into four sections, um, how we forecast eruptions, um, whether we're usually successful at them, um, and then what hinders us. And a lot of it comes down to our understanding of the subsurface. And then finally, I'll have the last uh, section on uh, risk mitigation and, uh, and what we do and what's important and uh, what, our, what the challenges are. It's important to start, especially for those who aren't as familiar with volcanoes, by just pointing out that there's a lot of different things that can happen at a volcano. There, it's not a, a single effect. Um, there are lava flows that can come out on the ground, like in 2018 at Kilauea, burying, uh, um, burying uh, lots of houses. You can have mud flows that are going down river valleys and affecting just those areas. Um, you can have ash fall that's uh, going into a plume up into the air and landing on roofs, causing them to collapse, poisoning uh, the local water supply in some cases, and making animals not be able to get food. And then you have the pyroclastic flows that are, uh, are very famous uh, for incinerating everything in their path. So they're different things and they don't always happen together. And that makes forecasting the effects and keeping people safe uh, especially complex. It's also important to recognize that there are different sizes of eruptions, and we uh, usually quantify those with the volcanic explosivity index that ranges from around one to about eight. The smallest uh, ero eruptions or explosions, you, if you were in the crater of the volcano itself, um, you would be affected by a VEI-1, but not outside of it whereas a VEI-8 is continental in scale. So it's sort of a logarithmic um, scale based on the amount of magma erupted and the height of the plume uh, that results. Oh, so I went, my arrow appears to be working now. Okay. Uh, so starting into the first section, um, what is it that we do when we forecast eruptions? And uh, so this is um, working with our colleagues. We normally want to work with multi-parameter data. Can you see my cursor? Does anybody have their microphone on to answer that? Yes. Okay. So uh, up at the in this panel right here, we have RSAM, which is a, uh, a measure of seismic energy release. Um, we have GPS data down here. We have next uh, SO2, so gas coming out of the volcano. And then we have observations of a variety of types that we can put on a timeline. And we can use all of these together to look at changes in the amount of activity and things that might indicate that uh, we're moving towards an eruption. And the way that the Volcano Observatory would represent this to the public in its simplest form would be a color code or an alert level that would be down here. In this case, where we're looking at data from Mount Agung in Indonesia, and I'll talk more about this later on, uh, where we've moved from a, a green color code that's not shown here into a, a yellow when the seismic energy was increasing uh, to an orange code showing that the eruption was uh, likely to take place soon, uh, red, uh, moving back between red and orange, et cetera. And we'll, we'll get more into this one later on, but just uh, letting you know that we put a lot of equipment on volcanoes, uh, seismic instrumentation is very important, but also volcano deformation, uh, geochemistry, and then observations, including satellite data, uh, thermal, and, and many other techniques. Um, these tech slides, by the way, are all from uh, my USGS colleague, Sarah Ogburn, who does a lot of database work for volcano data. And so she's put these four slides together right here, just talking about the, the monitoring data and then the global data here. 
uh, is, uh, allows us to have analogs to inform our expectations. And that is because for a given volcano, we might not have any information whatsoever about what it's done in the past. If we do have that information, we definitely want to use it. What, what happened in, in the past? What is the history of eruptions? Are they large eruptions? Are they small eruptions? Are they more likely to have certain kind of activity than others? We need that information to put that together with the monitoring data. And then we compare it uh, to other volcanoes that might be around uh, the world. So we can look at uh, Merapi volcano example, which is one that we're looking at right now and is very active. We can compare that to all volcanoes in the world or just andesite volcanoes or stratocones or the dome forming volcanoes. And in this particular case, you can see that dome form forming volcanoes are more likely to have uh, the, some of the larger VEI threes and four eruptions um, than some of the other ones that are shown in this plot. Anyway, uh, we can use databases such as WOVODAT that's uh, improved in Singapore these days, the Smithsonian. Uh, we have our own uh, ones that we're working on when VDAP, uh, the Alaska Volcano Observatory, and you put it all together and work, uh, and we're trying to share these resources uh, globally more and more these days, and that uh, provides us additional information. Then we have deterministic models, uh, numerical models, and other sorts of ways that we can uh, estimate the impacts of an impending eruption. For example, we can estimate, given a typical eruption of a typical vol of, of this particular volcano, which again is Agung, where we might expect the pyroclastic flows to go from uh, the Titan 2D model. Or using ASH 3D, we can estimate, given the wind patterns, uh, if the volcano erupted of a certain size right now, uh, what would be the thickness of deposits that we would expect downstream? Or uh, how about the mud flows from this volcano, uh, given the ones in the past, what is likely uh, the areas that would be inundated and uh, at most danger? So we have those informations and we can put them together. And one of the ways that we do that is we put together an event tree. And so in the event tree, we would come up with a, what we feel is the most likely scenarios for whether the volcano is going to erupt or not. If it's going to erupt, what is the size of the eruption that we're going to have? In this case, we think it's most likely to be VEI two or three. Uh, if it is that uh, VEI two or three, what are the effects that are going to happen? Most likely pyroclastic flow, definitely ash, a little bit less likely for some of these other hazards. And then uh, if it was this size of an eruption and we had the pyroclastic flow, how far would we estimate uh, that it was going to go? So these are all things that we would try to put together as an observatory and provide to the emergency managers, the municipal authorities, et cetera, um, that we would be working with. To, uh, to provide the information to the public. So summarizing this, uh, we need uh, good monitoring, we need good models, we need databases, we need uh, um, the, yeah, the deterministic models, and then we need to methodology to determine the probabilities. So filling out that event tree is not a simple thing either. Do you uh, just solicit the opinions of experts? Or do you just come up with a group decision uh, or a vote, uh, a consensus if you can? Or in, in the Italians frequently go through the exercise of putting together thresholds for monitoring data that they would expect would be required before you would get a certain kind of eruption. So these are a combination of thresholds and expert solicitations for a preformed um, preformed event tree that is automatically filled in once the activity starts happening. There's a lot of different ways to go about this, and that's not the point of this talk, but I'm just giving you a, a little bit of insight into how we might go about coming up with just the details that we would provide to uh, the partners in the civil defense community. So next is, is a little bit about um, our successes and our failures in doing forecasting. And before I start that, I wanna just point out that it's not um, a simple thing to do a useful forecast. Um, let's take an earthquake as an example. 
to be useful uh, to provide a forecast of an earthquake, you would need a time frame. You can't just say that, I mean, you can say that over the next 30 years, and that might be useful to people who are doing building codes, but it's not useful in terms of ev evacuation, for example. Um, you would need to know the magnitude of the event or the amount of ground shaking that's going to take place. If you're just predicting uh, a magnitude three earthquake, um, well, they happen all the time in Los Angeles, and so it's not a very useful piece of information. You would need geographic boundaries for the area that's going to be impacted. And then, of course, you need to make that forecast in a way that the public can understand what you're saying and act upon it successfully. So all of these things are difficult. And they're even more difficult when you're talking about volcanoes that have uh, many, many different kinds of impacts. And you really have to, in a way, be predicting them or forecasting them separately. Uh, this slide uh, shows you an example of forecasts by the Alaska Volcano Observatory. It's based on data, I think, from 2000 to 2015. And uh, in this case, a forecast is uh, considered successful if the Alaska, if the AVO moved the color code up uh, to orange or red prior to the eruption taking place. And uh, red color is good. So let's just look on the right side of the, of the charts here. And these are for monitored volcanoes in Alaska. The ones up here are ones that have a very sh short repose interval uh, of less than, you know, then in other words, they've erupted within the last 15 years. And you can see that three out of 16 um, were successfully uh, forecast. They moved the color code prior to the eruption. Um, 13 of them were detected at the time of the eruption. So they weren't able to do the a successful forecast. Um, but they did detect the eruption, which is important because one of the main things they try to do there is to warn aircraft that the plume is in the air. And so if they can do that within a few minutes, then, um, then they're happy. Um, on longer reposed volcanoes that haven't erupted for more than 15 years, it's actually much easier to do the forecast. Usually the magma makes a lot of noise. There's a lot of seismic energy that's released as the magma is moving up towards its surface. And so uh, at four out of five in this case uh, had successful forecasts. Now, if we're working on unmonitored volcanoes, we actually still can do some good work because we have regional seismic data. And, uh, and, and so in that case, um, we don't do very well, again, on frequently active volcanoes. They just don't have enough signal that we can use to forecast what's going to happen. Only one out of these eruptions was had a successful forecast. Um, they, uh, this is actually, I think the numbers were transcribed or uh, mixed up in the publication, um, but there would be uh, 16 of them that were detected and um, nine of them or 15 of them and nine of them that were uh, missed entirely. And that means that somebody Presumably a pilot had to tell them that there was an eruption going on. Um, and then again, we were better at detecting uh, when we have the regional network and we um, have something that erupts less frequently. By the way, uh, since 2015, we have introduced infrasound into our monitoring techniques. And so we are much, much better uh, at, at doing this. And so we are constantly making improvements. Uh, but this gives you an idea sort of of uh, the challenges. So we do better on monitor volcanoes and frequently active volcanoes um, are uh, harder to predict than ones that, uh, that erupt out of long-term quiescence. This is a diagram by Dan Miller, who used to be the, uh, the chief of the VDAP group a long time ago. And uh, it's, a, it's very popular and it kind of shows you what can happen during volcanic eruptions. In this case, you have your y-axis for the intensity of unrest and uh, the x-axis is time. And uh, this is just showing you here that uh, if our monitoring parameters are rapidly increasing with time, then we have a critical time by which we need to give decisions to our public officials and uh, because People are going to know what's going on. They're going to want some information. They're wanna, going to want to know whether they should evacuate or what other actions they should take place. Occasionally, you have an eruption that is happening out of nowhere. 
Um, and an example was the White Island eruption last year, of course, the Ontake eruption in Japan that killed a couple hundred people. And these are, these are really uh, generally non-magmatic eruptions. They're hydrothermal in nature for the hot water system that's at the summit of the volcano, but occasionally they can be volcanic or, or magmatic eruptions too. So sometimes it's just difficult. Other times it's just uh, becomes complicated because of lots of the different things that can happen. Uh, for example, uh, the volcano can erupt. Uh, and there's lots of examples uh, in which that has happened, case that has happened. And people are generally happy because they were provided useful information, hopefully, uh, prior to that eruption. Uh, sometimes the volcano goes back to sleep. Sometimes it may stay active for weeks or months. And then, uh, uh, and then finally move towards an eruption or indeed go back to sleep and you just had an intrusion beneath the volcano that didn't end up having uh, any surface effects. So this is again, the complexity of what we're dealing with and trying to, to uh, provide useful information in a system that is inherently uh, chaotic and very difficult to forecast. But we have had a lot of really important successes and it's always important to realize that we do provide a huge service to the global community and that is volcano observatories and volcano scientists. Uh, we have saved uh, many, many tens of thousands of lives, especially at Pinatubo and Merapi and, uh, and people uh, all the time are getting out of the way of the volcanoes because we do know enough about them to provide useful information. So that's always important for, uh, to point out. I'm going to give you an example now of uh, one of the VDAP responses that we had in late 2017. And this is one of the more complex situations and one that we, in some ways, provided a lot of useful information and in some ways were confounded by the challenges of providing, uh, providing that information. In this case, we're at Mount Agung in Bali, and uh, it's about 60 kilometers, 70 kilometers from Dempasar, which is the largest city. It's around a million people living in this region, and this is the mecca of, uh, of tourism for Indonesia. Lots and lots of people coming through here, and, uh, and so this is a place that a lot of people are interested in. And there had been an eruption in 1963, a VEI-5, one of the largest eruptions of the 20th century, and a thousand people had died. And this was well known by the people who lived there, although very few of them uh, remembered the eruption itself, but people knew about it. And so when the activity started uh, increasing in uh, early September, 2017, uh, it was notable. Uh, we got there, there were a couple of us who had been there for organizational meetings with uh, our colleagues from CVGHM in Indonesia. I was one of them. Uh, and they showed us maps of earthquakes that were being plotted. This is from regional data from uh, the regional earthquake authority. And that group was of the opinion that these were just regional earthquakes all along faults and not anything volcanic in nature. But the folks at CVGHM were not so sure. And in fact, they started moving towards uh, getting uh, better information. Um, there was a lot of equipment on the volcano that was not functioning properly. Some of it was functioning, but didn't have telemetry active. And so that's uh, one of the reasons we were asked to come in is to help make sure that all the equipment was functioning so that they would have as much monitoring data, data as possible. And so actually I went back home, but I ended up coming back later on and other people were there for about 10 weeks total. So this is just, again, this is a map of the earthquakes. They're all happening. This is the summit right here in the, in the crosshairs. You can see most of the earthquakes are a few kilometers to even 10 kilometers to the Northwest of the uh, volcano summit. And this is what the earthquakes looked like in early October, kind of at the prime period of activity at Agung. And uh, each one of these little blue wiggles represents an individual earthquake, probably a magnitudes uh, uh, ones and twos, but there were plenty of threes and plenty of felt earthquakes during this entire process. At the same time, there was additional heat that was coming out of the volcano uh, through the crater. There was more steam coming out the top and everybody could see that and anybody who went to the summit, which people continued to do, even though it was uh, 
band, uh, they were able to show increased fumarolic activity in the crater. So our colleagues uh, got together the information they had from geologic hazard maps and knowing the effects of the eruption in 1963 and using various models to come up with a plan for uh, the exclusion zones that they would uh, provide to their partners, um, showing the highest hazard areas. And in general, they, had, um, they, they tried to keep people out from about nine kilometers away from the volcano in most cases. So they set up these, uh, these exclusion zones. Uh, people were moved out of the area um, because they were worried that they were going to have a recurrence of the 1963 event. This is one of the examples showing at this point in time, which was September 26th, that 75,000 people had been evacuated and showing that indeed uh, the shelters were all over the island. Um, but a couple of them, the large ones, were uh, still uh, outside the hazard zone, but close to the volcano. And here's another one of these timelines showing the color code and uh, the earthquake activity in this case. Um, the gray bars represent the earthquake count. Over here, you can count them. The RSAM, the seismic energy, is the blue squiggles and the black averaged out line. And then we have our alert levels from green to yellow to red and orange. Uh, and you can see that the intense earthquake activity is occurring in this period here, which is in late September to around uh, October 25th or something like that. First eruption, though, isn't until November 20th. And that's the pink lines. And then all of these individual pink lines are relatively short-lived explosions that are occurring out of the summit. Uh, and they occur for well over a year into this process. It turns out a lava, lava flow came into the crater and filled up about a third of the crater in the time with lots of explosions out the top, but it never overtopped the crater. And, uh, and so the amount of damage was relatively small in the end. But um, this was a very scary time. There was a, there was a huge amount of earthquake energy being expended and um, in fact, there was a magnitude 4.9 that appeared to help trigger the system towards eruption that occurred, I think, on November 5th. Um, but uh, again, a, a complicated situation. And in this case, the eruption didn't start until almost two months after the original very, very intense uh, start to the earthquake sequence. Uh, just a, a, a map, and this is kind of this is kind of to summarize that part of our lack of ability to forecast is our lack of understanding of exactly what's going on in the subsurface. Our working model at the time for understanding and interpreting the monitoring data was that uh, magma had intruded from underneath the volcano, uh, was coming into maybe half you know ten kilometer depth, and was pressurizing a nearby fault and causing all sorts of earthquakes in that area between Bartur volcano and Agung volcano, and then eventually moved on towards eruption. Now we got a lot of the uh, GPS and INSAR data that came in towards the end of the process and uh, was worked on by colleagues. Uh, some of it we knew before the final eruption in November, some of it we didn't. And our model at this point, as published in Siobhana et al, uh, is that Yes, the magma did come in uh, underneath the volcano, but then it actually put a dike out that caused a deformation uh, that was picked up in between these two volcanoes, as well as the earthquakes in the region uh, above the intrusion. But then magma was able to continue up the conduit towards the surface with relatively vague and mellow seismicity uh, during that final part of the magma ascent. The noisy part was the creation of this dike that moved out from, from the volcano. And uh, Juliet Biggs and uh, Albino wrote a paper uh, on the uh, GPS and INSAR data, actually the INSAR data. Their model is that the actual magma came up directly uh, beneath this area and didn't come out from un beneath the volcano. So that's a, yet a different volcano. And it illustrates, again, that there's more than one way to interpret all of the data we've got. Uh, going on here. So summary statement for this section, uh, our forecasts are very useful, but they are 
uncertain in timing, magnitude, and effects. And that's that's the reality that we have, and it's probably not going to change anytime soon in terms of the details that we can provide to the people who are doing the actual evacuations. So the, the next part I want to get into a little bit is that our understanding of the subsurface is inadequate for the task of having really robust geological models that we can use to do the data interpretation or to have deterministic models for how eruptions are going to progress. These models are critical for us understanding what can happen, but they're not as useful in turn in terms of understanding what will happen. Um, and because the models all require fairly uh, specific uh, values for a number of parameters like compressibility and permeability and seismic velocity, the temperature structure, the stress regime, uh, the mineralogy of uh, all sorts of things that are underneath the ground and typically not accessible to us. So I'll give you an example from uh, Yellowstone. Um, and this is a this is an example from uh, a, a paper that, that we wrote a number of years ago, which is mostly based on our, our geological and long term understanding. And that is that uh, magma is coming out of the hot spot at Yellowstone. It's rising into the crust. It's uh, partially crystallizing. It's uh, creating silicic uh, crystal fractionates. It's also melting the crust. And the, you mix those materials and create silicic melts that are extracted and brought towards the surface into a silicic magma, magma reservoir that uh, sometimes has big eruptions, uh, it, it, lots of big lava flows and some notable uh, caldera forming eruptions. Our understanding of this system in general is somewhat hindered by the fact that there are all of these hydrothermal systems above that intercept the heat flow and create everything uh, having uh, maximum temperatures of the boiling temperature of water that intercept the, the gases that are coming up and the, and the solutes. And so uh, they're creating lower temperature minerals than, uh, and gases than would be coming off of the magma. Uh, this area, of course, creates its own earthquakes and its own deformation, which in, in, makes it challenging for us to, to understand what's happening down below. We do have views of what's down below through geophysics. And so an example of, uh, of, of one of those studies is here from Huang et al from the University of Utah group. And it provides a very similar uh, model for the kinds of uh, ones that I just showed you in the last plot. We have the mantle plume, uh, the basaltic partial melt is thought to be about 2% on average melt, melt, melted with the rest of the crust 98% being crystalline. Um, the uh, rhyolite in the upper crust is thought to be on, on average 10% melt with 90% being crystalline. And, uh, and, and that's uh, pretty much what we know. Um, the, the spatial resolution of these sorts of models, in this case, this is done from teleseisms and a combination of teleseisms and local earthquakes typically with the wavelength of the earthquakes that we're looking at, we can really only get spatial resolution on the order of 10 by 10 kilometer blocks in the X and Y. And so that means that that 10% partial melt can be distributed in a lot of different ways uh, that are, could be highly disconnected little blobs melt, could be in some, uh, some different dikes or a vertical dike, or possibly even all aggregated in one place as a 125 cubic kilometer, in this case, uh, eruptible melt that would be enough to create a VEI-6 eruption. So without knowing higher spatial resolution on the systematics of what things look like down there, we don't have the ability to really use that information in detail for understanding what's going to happen next. One of the things that when I was the scientist in charge of Yellowstone that I, I occasionally would come across uh, various papers that directly contradicted each other and made it a challenging for me to provide uh, information about them to the public uh, through our social media or our website. Here's an example of a paper that came out in 2010 um, using seismic tomography to hypothesize or to show in this case uh, that they thought that there was a more highly melted region that was gaseous that was beneath the Norris Geyser Basin in the northern part of Yellowstone. Uh, 
But if you compared it with a paper on hypocenter locations uh, at Yellowstone, um, that was in the very, very seismogenic region, uh, about five kilometers depth in that area, and therefore anticipated to be at temperatures well below 400 degrees C, making it hard to be a highly molten uh, magmatic region. So um, again, it, it's, uh, it's all good science. It's all getting us where we uh, need to go and providing us things to, to argue about and think about, but it's, it's challenged sometimes to use this information when we're just trying to tell people uh, what, what they need to do and what our most likely events are going to be uh, if the system were to erupt. And this, I wanna talk a little bit about geothermal systems here um, because I think they're really interesting. And I think they're important also in terms of what is above the magma chamber and, and what is the nature of the crust and what is happening uh, to transfer heat and fluids uh, away from the magma body. This is an example, uh, this is from Krofla. Um, and this was uh, an image that was based on uh, electromagnetic data resistivity, and they uh, I, were able to come up with a, a systematics of where the magma chambers were thought to be so that they could do a drilling program. The inner ICDP could drill down to uh, almost four kilometers to come up with a high temperature zone in between the magmas thought to be in the supercritical area where they could get high temperature fluids and, uh, and do some experiments and learn more about the potential for geothermal energy. So they started the drilling program, but at two kilometers, they hit magma. Um, so completely different than what they were expecting based on the geophysical results in the area. And the, uh, they lost a lot of the drilling fluid, they got the bit stuck and they had to stop the experiment uh, and had found uh, all of this rhyolitic material that was uh, great for a whole series of research papers that came out as a result of this. Um, so I'm gonna get back to this in a second, but I wanna take a quick diversion to what we know about geothermal areas and especially the high temperature parts of geothermal areas moving down towards the magma. So our typical understanding uh, over the last 40 years is that when you get beneath the geothermal system, so that would be over here in this geothermal area with high permeability and we can extract fluids that are high temperature, high enthalpy, and we can create power with them. Uh, when we get down and drill, we're going to get into areas where um, the conductivity, uh, is the temperature iso isotherms move very quickly into higher and higher temperature. Uh, we expect uh, in general that the, um, we're not going to have much permeability down there. And in fact, when they did the drilling at Kakanda to get down to this uh, depth of 3,700 meters, they did in fact get to temperatures that were above 500 degrees C. Uh, we can talk about how they did that later on if you're interested. Um, they found that the temperatures increased very quickly. They had very poor permeability. They had really nasty acid gassy fluids that came out, but not very much of them. And this is the, 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 the basic understanding that we have and with that was confirmed through this drilling program. Um, this is a seismic down here. It's ductile rock. And so uh, it doesn't break very easily and it's not high permeability. And uh, Bob Fournier, one of my colleagues at the USGS has written all sorts of papers about this general uh, brittle to ductile transition in geothermal systems and how you'll build up fluid pressure beneath uh, and can ex expel fluids into the hydrothermal areas. Um, but that in general, um, these are very impermeable regions down here. So moving back to Krofla, the surprise was that when they tested that well after their finding of magma in inside the geothermal well, they found that when they released everything, they got 140 bars of pressure with temperatures up to 450 degrees C for a year. And so enormous uh, permeabilities. It's possible that the fluid they were withdrawing was the same drilling fluid that they would put into the rock, but nobody knows for sure. Um, and the amount of enthalpy that was coming out of this well is sufficient to create a 40 megawatt well uh, energy, uh, which is about 10 times your average geothermal well. So this is completely the opposite of what we expect uh, in a, um, 
in the geothermal systems based on our previous understanding of ore deposits and of the Kakanda drilling. And um, so it just illustrates in this case that there's a lot of things that are going on down there and there's a lot of variability and we don't always understand why the situation is one place uh, and uh, can be different in another. Um, so I've done a little bit of, uh, of talking about unsuccesses in uh, geophysics. I, I, I'm not going to talk about that for petrology uh, because I'm a petrologist, but I, I will say that also, you know, and a lot of people are doing really exciting work these days, uh, is uh, Megan among them, in the, the topic of geospeedometry using uh, rocks and uh, erupted rocks and looking at um, rims uh, of uh, that are growing around crystals in magma chambers and looking at the variation of trace elements with different diffusion coefficients to tease out times um, when things happened in the magma prior to eruption. And these have led to some really important discoveries about maybe how mushes are uh, disaggregated and liquids can be taken out of magma chambers by events that are occurring, maybe even only a few years before eruption. So there's a lot of huge and important stuff that's coming out of that. But I would say that it also isn't that easy to use, no matter what you, you read in the introductions of papers, uh, in terms of understanding or forecasting when something's going to erupt or why it's going to erupt. There's still a lot of ambiguities in terms of the diffusion coefficients or uh, understanding when the melting occurred versus when the crystallization of that final rim occurred. And, uh, and there's also um, just the challenge that you're looking at rocks that were erupted last time it erupted and you're not necessarily learning anything about what's happening now. So summarizing here, um, there's a lot of uncertainty about the structure and diversity of magma th hydrothermal systems. And some of these conceptual barriers make it difficult for us to use for deterministic models for eruption forecasts. There's just too much variability and there's too many variables that we don't know every time a new volcano gets active. So there's really no one size, fit, one size fits all model that we can use. And that's, again, it's maybe I'm just repeating the same thing over and over again, but um, I think it's a, it's a useful thing for people to keep in mind. So the last part of the talk, uh, the last 10, 10 minutes or so, I'm going to talk about what we do in terms of uh, risk mitigation and what really are some of the important things that we need to know about in order to keep people safe. And mostly what I've talked about so far is the science part of it, the part that the scientists do, the actual forecasts and the probability trees and the understanding of what's beneath the surface. And that's important, but no matter how good our monitoring is and no matter how correct our interpretation is, that's not necessarily gonna keep people safe. Um, people did know what was happening at Nevado del Ruiz in 1985. Uh, people did have the correct interpretations. They thought that the volcano was erupting on the day that it erupted on November 13th. They knew there was a strong possibility that uh, floods were coming down the mountain. Some people were alerted, other people were not. The people in these towns uh, had already made decisions that they uh, they were not going to, that, you know, that the information they'd been given was not sufficient that they would evacuate anybody. And then the, the floods came down in the middle of the night. So uh, one thing is that you need to make sure that the forecasts that you're giving to the emergency managers and the land managers uh, and the decision makers are actionable, um, that we're not being vague, that we're providing information as concrete and uh, useful as possible. It's important that the scientists all come up with uh, messages and that they're consistent with those messages. Um, yes, it's true that in Dante's Peak, uh, Pierce Brosnan was away, able to get away with uh, being the, the lone cowboy, but uh, generally bad things are going to happen when the scientists are all going in different directions. Uh, we need, in general, uh, a functioning partnership with all of the civil defense agencies that are relevant. And there are a lot of them, and every country functions differently. Um, in the United States, we work, uh, incident command is usually run through the land manager, through the park service or the forest service, 
you have to work with the state emergency managers, there's the county emergency managers, uh, and they need to know you. They need to know you all the time. They're constantly switching roles. They might move to a new state. So you have a new person that you have to educate. You need to have arrangements with them, agreements with them that define the exact responsibilities of the different organizations and come up with a plan so that when things do happen, everybody knows who they are and they know what their, their uh, swim lane is. And, uh, and this is the case all over the world, is that you need agreements, you need partnerships, you need exercises, and you need to focus on this a lot of time. If you don't, then you end up meeting each other at the time of the emergency and people are not likely to listen to your message. And then you need people to listen to the emergency responders because they're not always going to. And the big challenge is often animals. Uh, at Agung, uh, most of the people who owned animals were high up on the mountain. Um, they, they would have a, a goat or some sheep and very little land. And usually they would go out, the people go out and forage for, the, uh, for those animals uh, and bring it back to the animal at the end of the day on their little motor scooter. So uh, if they have to evacuate and the animal has to stay back at the farm or in their, in their house, then they can't feed their animals and that's their livelihood. And there aren't places usually for the animals to go during an evacuation. So people are gonna be frustrated and they're certainly not want, gonna wanna stay away from the house for a month. Um, so uh, not only do you need to have a clear message and uh, an actionable working partnership with the emergency responders, but you need to have systems that will, uh, will allow the people to want to, be, to do what, what you're asking them to do. Um, so just, uh, I think the last uh, two slides, this one talks a little bit about our philosophy and capacity building and how we provide assistance to uh, foreign countries, especially ones that are resource poor, but have high uh, volcanic risk. Uh, pretty much everything we do, we wanna make it permanent. We have the luxury with USAID um, providing our funding um, that uh, USAID gives us the money and we can donate equipment to um, those countries. And so what we do is we want to teach them how to use it and we can help them from afar in terms of making sure that the data are flowing. But um, we don't come in with equipment that we have to bring home a year later. We're typically working with the people who make a difference, and that is the ones who work for the volcano observatories. They're the ones who are going to have these jobs for 20 or 30 years. And we hope that we can make their jobs easier so that it's fun for them to be there because they're getting equipment that they can use to do their jobs. Um, we don't usually work as much with universities except in places like Ecuador, where the university runs the National Volcano Monitoring Networks. And uh, we often, um, well, we, we want to offer a true collaboration. So uh, we are not paid to do research. Um, we do some research and some of our people are research scientists, but when we do assistance, that's not our goal. Our goal is to further the people that we're working with. We want to stand behind them. We don't talk for them. We don't talk to the press in the countries where we work and we provide them information they can use to do their job better. Uh, we want to make things sustainable. So for example, if you're going in and you're setting up satellite telemetry, they're probably not going to be able to pay for that data after you leave. Even sometimes we found um, where the only real viable solution is cellular data. Um, we'll go and while we're down there, we can buy a three month data card for that uh, modem. Um, but then we find out that six months later, they're no longer paying the bills for the, for the cell phones. And so it's not really a long-term solution. So we try to come in with radios, um, digital radios that we can set up, um, but it's a much more of a difficult long-term solution to do that. You need relays and uh, it's a bit fussy to use those. So um, it's the way it is. And then we are focused on institution building, not assistance to individuals. You know, we might find that there's one really fantastic, promising scientist there, and we love working with that person. 
But the reality is that person may get a better job down the road. They're not going to be paid enough by the Volcano Observatory, or they're going to get a PhD somewhere and become a professor and leave the country. And so we have to really put our attention into making the institution better, not just the people in the institution. All right, so my final take home messages. Uh, eruptions are really hard to forecast in a useful way and even under optimal circumstances, um, they remain highly uncertain. The one caveat I could say is that once the eruption system starts, things usually reach a steady state and they get relatively easy to forecast. Um, but when you're in the early days, especially at a volcano that hasn't erupted for a long time, there's a lot of, a lot of challenge in putting together forecasts. Uh, the above statement is um, partly because understanding of the subsurface remains insufficient and will largely remain so for quite a while. Uh, one thing I think we need to do is more drilling programs to really uh, look at the details and the heterogeneities and, and the differences and do more in situ measurements down deep. Science is, is only a part of people keeping people safe, education, planning, communications, communications, communications and trust are really important. And uh, we, uh, we need a long-term view and we need to build institutions if we're gonna have success with making volcano observatories grow worldwide. But that's all I've got. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Jake, that was awesome. Uh, let's see if we have any questions for Jake. Can you guys raise your hands? Wong Han. Quick off the mark there, go ahead. Hi, um, thank you so much. It was so interesting to see like different data and then they have different interpretation. Uh, I do have two questions. So in the prediction forecast part, you show this graph where you have this decision, critical window for making a public decision. And then after that, you have a lot of different scenarios. So sometimes they do quiet down so I'm curious about the public reaction to when it actually drops down and then do that make them like, oh, I, we, we shouldn't trust them because it's just like 30% chance it's actually gonna happen. That's my first question. And then my second question is related to the last part. When you talk about you, I think you mentioned you prefer, you guys prefer to collaborate with, um, I mean, not with universities because they, because you wanna work with people who have long-term, like longer term position. So I was wondering for like data managed plan, like do you guys do encourage uni local university or researchers to actually use the data that you collect? Yeah, uh, okay, I'll, I'll do the, the first question first. And yeah, the answer is sure, people get upset. Uh, the emergency managers get upset. I think one of the, the things that we do uh, in the USGS certainly within our country is we really try to point out the whole range of possibilities. You know, we don't try to give them one, one, this is what's going to happen. We say this is the most likely scenario and we think it because this, for example, this is what happened last time or this is what happens at similar volcanoes. So we try to provide information that will allow people to understand why we're not being uh, as precise as they would like us to be and to, to give them um, as good information as we can while not trying to um, deceive them. And so it's a challenge. And we, we tell our partners to do that too, or we, we hope that they will do that. Um, but we don't actually do that when we're overseas, really. We leave that up to, to the partner agencies. We stay in the background. We're there to, to fix the uh, telemetry and to, you know, to do things uh, to support them. Uh, in terms of your, your second question, uh, we, we, we are happy to facilitate any collaborations that we can. Uh, we don't usually try to, uh, I mean, occasionally we will archive data for them and make it easier, but that, that's relatively rare. Uh, if they have a university nearby that they can partner with, great. Um, you know, and and I'll, you know, in, the, in the case of Ecuador, they are a university. Um, but I think, yeah, I think that everybody's always stronger when they partner with other groups. And so if you have universities that have strong uh, uh, funding and equipment and ability to, to further your, your goals, then you should work with them. And we certainly wouldn't stand in the way of that. 
Ha having said that, it, the countries that we work with are extremely different in the way that they view uh, international collaborators or even domestic collaborators. There are, there are places where there's a lot of distrust of different organizations. There are countries where there are two volcano monitoring agencies that are uh, in, in, in direct conflict because there's different ministries and the ministries each think that they have, they have the right to do it. And we have some ambiguity even in the, US, in the US in that the USGS is responsible for the eruption warnings, but NASA has a lot of equipment and NOAA has the responsibility for anything going through the air. So they usually do the warnings in terms of ash uh, fall. And so there's a lot of work for us to be coming up with uh, plans and, um, and agreements and meetings so that we have worked out the kinks in the system as well as we can and people understand their roles. Thank you. Um, so I have a question. Um, it seems like in a lot of eruptions, um, I'm thinking about the Fuego 2018 eruption in particular, which was like really unexpected, but um, there's maybe the general population aren't aware of the hazards. And I'm wondering what you do for education and what the best educational tools are for um, letting the locals know uh, what the hazards are. Yeah, um, you know, the, 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 the Fuego is an interesting situation in that uh, generally the Cone Red, who's the emergency response group, most of them know what, what's going on. Um, certainly the Insevume is the geologic group and they're very underfunded. Um, and not, don't have a whole lot of people, but they know what's going on too. Um, there were two different communities at threat uh, on, on June 3rd, 2018. Uh, one of them was the, the, the resort area with the golf courses and everybody there uh, saw what was happening that morning and evacuated. Um, then there was the group on the other side of the river, which was mostly indigenous uh, to some degree squatters, people who weren't necessarily completely li legal living in the villages high up on the volcano. And uh, they did not evacuate. And uh, I don't know even if they got really good warnings, but they were not prepared and knowledgeable enough and trusting enough. I mean, you can imagine if you're uh, the situation there, the, po the politics of people kind of semi um, illegally living in these communities and um, being, uh, you know, they, they're not, um, uh, yeah, they, so they, they didn't trust the people and they, um, and they, they didn't know how to react. And a lot of them died. A few, a few hundred people died um, that day. Uh, the, the, I think, you know, there's a, a rich academic interest in the subject of how to do communications and to be successful in communications. I don't know all the answers. We try to delve into this to some degree in VDAP. Um, uh, generally though, it's people doing lots of visits to communities and getting, working with the influencers in those communities so that they know what's happening. So the religious authorities or the, the Hindu priests in Bali or the, the Catholic priests uh, in, in the local communities around in Guatemala, uh, working and providing information that might be cartoon books that are gonna be effective with kids to tell them about what the volcano can do, especially in these really active volcanoes, but ones that maybe only erupt every 20 years uh, in a big way like Fuego, people forget where they move there in the intervening period and they don't know uh, about the dangers. So um, it's, it's clearly something that's really important. It's not the part that the scientists typically work on. And yet um, nobody else knows enough about it to really do the communications. Um, so we have an important role in trying to educate the educators and to uh, provide programs. And, and USAID helps us do that. So that's, that's, uh, that's great. And um, yeah, I, I didn't really mention it, but um, 
the USGS pays half our salary, USAID pays half of the salary for VDAP, and then all of our walking around money, all of the travel money and everything else is paid for by USAID. So that's something that we wouldn't be able to do with the money that Congress gives the USGS for volcano monitoring. Thanks. Oh, Phil, do you have a question? Yeah, I can't raise my hand for some reason. In, in my view, um... Hazard prediction changed about 10 years ago when the Italians threw a few people in jail for uh, their earthquake predictions. Is VDAP concerned about this sort of thing? You're putting the tools in the hands of people that it takes some time to come up to speed with. And um, you're standing in the background because you're not really making the predictions. Is there, any, is there any thought on this? Are there hot spots where there are concerns of getting this equipment into the hands of people that might not be fully uh, prepared to make predictions and the implications of those? Yeah, that's a wonderful question and a, and a challenging one because every country is going to be different and it's not hard to, to predict. Uh, it's the wrong word there, but uh, <laughs> that, uh, that we could have, you know, if, if things worked out badly, um, that the people we work with um, you know, not to even mention what happens in the U.S., but the people that we work with could get in, get in trouble if things didn't work out. And obviously, we would, if we, if something that we had said or done pushed them in the direction, a bad direction, we would feel horrible about it. I don't know that we would individually be responsible in any way, but it, it wouldn't be a good thing for our program. Um, and yeah, uh, you know, generally. Um, in many or most countries, if people are doing their job and they're using best practices and they're clearly trying to do the job as well as they can, then they won't get in trouble for it. But um, we've seen a lot of crazy things. And so uh, it, uh, certainly the, the, that time in Italy was really troubling for anybody, uh, anybody in science. Um, but it also, I think, maybe also helped the Italians uh, understand what um, what was appropriate for them to say and what was not appropriate for them to say. Uh, but you know, th it was a it was a bad situation there. I'm glad it's it's worked out uh, for the people who were initially in trouble. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, we we're always told in the USGS that if we're if we are working within the confines of our job and we're using best practices and we document what we're doing and we document why we're making decisions that uh, we will be supported by the, the Department of Interior for anything that we do or anything that goes wrong. Um, yeah. And I've never seen that that wasn't the case. So we, we, we go on that assumption. Yeah. Well, I've had the opportunity to hear Dave Hill talk about predictions in Eastern California and like the movie Dante's Pig, those were some heated, not on his part, mm -hmm. but some of the people that attended, they were very heated, a lot on the line for a lot of people. So, yeah. Very measured response. Yeah, that was a really contentious one in the US. Uh, we haven't had anything quite like that, that since then, fortunately. Mm -hmm. And I can say, you know, the, the one that I talked about in Agung, um, that was a really challenging situation for them and, but I think that overall, CVGHM did a credible job, um, that the people who mattered uh, were backing them. And uh, they, they came out of it stronger than before. They got a lot of new funding to improve their volcano observatories after that happened. And they're making a lot of, a lot of big advances now. Uh, the other thing that happened, you may remember, is that tsunami off of Ana Krakatau when the volcano collapsed and killed a, a few hundred people on the, the edge of Java. And um, so that was another uh, really notable event that uh, caused a lot of changes in Indonesia. Um, but yeah, the, the, um, the Bali was, was a really crazy situation because of the IMF and World Bank meetings that were planned for the next year, the need to build roads, the need to build hotels and all of the gravel that was needed for that was coming off of the mountain at like, you know, three, 2000 meters elevation. So th those people needed to, to, be, to be doing their work and the volcano was preventing them to do it from doing it. And so there was a lot of pushback about the evacuations.
Okay, I don't see any more hands up or comments. Last call for questions. So I know I missed some people last week, so I <laughs> don't want to miss anyone. Okay, in that case, let's all raise our virtual hands and thank Jake very much for coming. And that was a really great talk. Thanks, Jake. Oh, thanks. thanks for having me. Appreciate it.